I am very, very happy to be here. It brings me Simcha on the Chanukah where we're supposed to be happy. It's a great schud, it's a great honor and a privilege to see you guys again. I didn't have I didn't think that I'll have a chance right a week after to see again these holy faces and holy souls and it's a tremendous joy for me. So first of all I want to thank you. Many years ago, exactly <coughs> at this time of the year, we were at a war. And again we find ourselves in a war. And since you know best all about this war, more so probably than we do, I'd like to share with you some thoughts about this war. We will share some ideas. We will share some fascinating questions and answers in the halakha, and we will see what we can come out with it, that we can take with us to carry over out of Hanukkah into our lives. So let's present our first case. When the whole thing started in Simchat Torah, you know that some places it took two and three days for the Israeli army to go in and conquer, reconquer, take back our places. In one of the places, Simchat Torah was Shabbat, and then the following day on Sunday, the terrorists, the Hamas, the Machshimam, were still there in their kibbutz. It's okay, I'm going to go to the Simchat Torah. It's okay, I'm going to go to at one point, there was a family that the father <coughs> had to take shelter in one house. And the family, the mother and kids, were in the other house. And in Sunday morning, Yisuchag, the mother suddenly saw that the tefillin of the father is with her. So she asked her son, we're going to call him Ruven, Ruven, I want you to cross the street and go to daddy and give him his tefillin. <coughs> Sunday morning, when the Hamas were still there, there was a family that the mother and kids are in the house and the father had to go to a different house yesterday when the whole thing started and he found himself they were separated. Sunday morning the mother realized that the feeling of the husband is with her. So she says to her son, go quickly, cross the street and go over to where daddy is hiding and give him that feeling. <laughs> You realize, for the kid to cross the street, it's suicidal. The Hamas are out there with guns, and if they see him, they're going to shoot him. Is the kid allowed to listen to his mother? Is the mother allowed to send the kid? 
For what? For tefillin? Can you risk your life for tefillin? I like to very well. A nutun, the bang, 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 the there was a grandfather, an old grandfather, that once came to say to sit a whole day, to spend the day with his daughter and with the grandchildren. He wanted to spend the day with him. And he came in the morning, and he noticed that his daughter called one of her daughters, and she says to her, Rachel, come help me in the kitchen one second. And Rachel starts yelling, Why me? Why me? You always call me. Why are you calling me? Call Chaim. So she calls Chaim. <coughs> Chaim, come help me in the kitchen. Chaim says, Why are you calling me? You always call me. Call Moshe. A little later, an hour later, she says, Moshe, can you please come? I want you to take out the garbage. And Moshe starts yelling, Why me? You always call me. Call Leah. Half an hour later, Leah, can you come help me for a second? I need your help. Ima, you always call me. Why are you calling me? You always call me. Call one of the other brothers and sisters. Why are you calling me? And this went on and on and on the whole day. Nihani <laughs> I don't have a cook, I don't get sent it. Law, K, K, and I put K paddles like cables and echo going, Coloco, who do on a coke, Halo, who do a coat, and I take it. And I had come out cooking and I had no team as a second. This is a coyote, so I born to carry a piece of it. Law, Patam Pato, I cook it there. Law, cable and echo going, Coco, buy on one of me a mom, one of the team. It is an accident for young red. The grandfather was very, very upset. All day long. Why me? Why me? Why me? At night, they were all eating dinner. And he says to his family, I want to tell you a story. You know that I'm a Holocaust survivor. But I never told you how I survived. I want to tell you. I started to... Holocaust <laughs> So he told his family, when the Nazi Yimach Shimam came to our town, they separated the women and the little kids and the men who were strong and can work. They told all the women and children, they have to go on one train and the men will go on a different train. Now, they don't, didn't know that the women and kids will die and the men will stay around for a while because they can work. They didn't know that. <laughs> Langa alam kai zaman zaman ni teh holo hin pia bol wan tel nazi teh hin israel teh holo si ko ma ta seiva pasal pasal ho ahat na tong thaina si si chu mun khada um sa uwa nu me ila japang ho si si chu mun khada um sa uwa pasal si si chu train khana ki tol ding a si mu wa ama ho si si chu na tong ni a ki tu diu he ai cha nu me ho le japang ho na tong thailo de si si chu train khat pa to diu a thi ding a pu diu he tai di so ba thi diu ko ma cha ki sa pu wet so i told this family i was a very little kid Smoking young, and I went with my mother, and suddenly my mother saw, Oi! I have daddy's feeling with me! So she said to me, Go, get out of the train, go to the other train where daddy is, and give him the feeling. And this was very, very dangerous. There are Nazi officers with guns, machine guns out there, and if they see me, they will shoot. That's <laughs> what I Kayong, 
Cilang napa tefin ngapi dengan hiat itu. Ibu nak ladin muncul. Apa ni ni ya hiat le? Nanti supaya harus nak kabi gam dia kabi dia hiat tuan tuan apa tu? Sepang apa tu? Nah, thal thal lagi cai so kaya itu. Sakit sepu tu, ane ulah hiat. Nah, thal lagi cai so kaya kabi dia hiat itu. Abang kata no eh tefin itu hiat lang napa ngapi dia tidak solat. So I quickly took that fitting from my mother and I went out of the train. It was very dangerous, but I don't know how. Until today, I don't know why they didn't shoot me. And I crossed over and I came to my father's train and I started yelling, Daddy, 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 Daddy! And he found me. And he started hugging me and kissing me. He says, What are you doing here? And he said, Mommy sent me with that fitting to give you. So he hugged me. He said, Thank you very much. And he said, Go fast. Go back fast to Mommy before they catch you. Ay lahin, pati tam kaya le. Akak payong hin, akak hayeng tay. Kala ito yung nihile, kahit po ibola ay kapo. Ay move ito, ay ba ay kapo ito. Isi ay busy yung kahit tapo ito. Amon kaka sunatson, kapat eflin kapin, ala kapay no eflin so. Akila ay mo ay ay mo pa na sun. Ang ay 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 ven hile, ay ko ay yung akak yung tay ito. Isi ay pinong bolam pinong kaya bolam lai ay ito. Chin lang gang sila na kinong lai dinga ay ito. Ay ko ay ay no solid. So I started running to the doors of the train, and as I got to the train, to the doors, they closed the doors, and it was too late, and I got stuck with my father. I didn't know at that time, but that's what saved my life, because my mother and all my brothers and sisters, they all died. But because I came to my father, I stayed alive. Kena hello wangin, kaso piti hosi si tok kanu yang train kena ti si su abon nak tigam tan, nak kei kahindo taya. So he says to his family, so do you know why I am here today? Because when my mother said, go quickly, give the filling to daddy, I didn't say why me, why me, give it to one of my other brothers, give it to my sisters. No, I ran quickly to do what my mother asked, and that's why I'm here. Ya tu, velau tak ada siapa yang saya tu tak kau mana. Nihat mana bola tu ni mikau ke hingdot dia kau mham. Jadi tu kanu kanu interfering tu kapal kau mak kapit tengah air solat tu. Ibu anak kau ikat tipu ya. Kalau kapit tengah air kau tak solat ikat tipu ya. Abet beren kau lain kau kapit tengah air. Ya tu kanu 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 tu saya kau mana kau kapit tengah air tu. Tu ni mikau ah hingding aku om teh air. So he says this grandchildren, you know why you are here? Because many, many years ago, me, your grandfather, I didn't ask my mother, why me, why me, why me? Ya, so, I told you, I said, if you think I'm not going to lie, 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 But now we have to ask a question. Can you risk your life for Tefillin? Ayin la, a question abu la ado apa sih dong kita ulat tu? Tefillin apa kapi nadi ngat so ayin ko a chan 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 teh ding din muna on so. We know that there are three big 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 sins, and they are immorality, killing someone, or idol worship. That one has to be willing to give over his life. But for everything else, one doesn't have to give over his life. Yeah, so kaya mabangong at so iti ting lang him in ahin ko ato do ding mutar ham ti ale eh minim siyem tuho alawale abodal zara alawale zon tang ho so tum si si bosa na kina zo kikan dia kiti ahi ay na tefilin ding at so kina kikan tema na dem. What do you say? Iti galba. Was the kid right? The grandfather who was a kid many years ago when he got out of the train and risked his life. There were Nazis out there. Or in our story, back down south, is he allowed to listen to his mother and go outside to risk his life to give his father the fitting? If na hiya le zona te sa po sud ania ulay ana bol pa sud te fitting ding zala ayin kuat sana aga pi sa pa ay ayin bol ay sa til bol sa mutan ay dinam ayin kuat sana te fitting aga pi sa sa tuwa in zala ay sa pa dalom lang ay til sol pa sa mga sud na sa tong pa sud anu te sa sa tipe ta angay angay ding sa mutan ay hindi ka. What do you say? Iti galo naman siya. Kaya mutal buong dito siya. Hindi ko siya sa zero mutal. Zero mutal. Not allowed. Anyone thinks it's okay? Ati din hiyan le ano in ahiat doa to la. Ahit doa to la. Ata pang panamahin ko. Akiit na din sa ahiat sa ahiat sa nga to. 
האם היותר הבינה, מה יותר חשוב, מה יותר חשוב בשביל הילד? אז לכן היא שלחה, אז לכן הוא צריך לעשות את זה. אבל הוא גייבר פרמישן to risk his life. אז כיוון שהאימא אוהבת אותו, אז אם זה היה כל כך מסוכן, אז היא לא היה שולח אותה. שולח אותה. Who says she's right? Maybe she's wrong. Maybe the mother is wrong. She is assessing things. It was a miracle that the Nazis didn't shoot him. Who says you're right to do that? Can you risk your kid's life for the mitzvah of Tfilim? Everybody knows. There are Nazi officers with machine guns out there. Very dangerous. Can we find any source in the Torah to a similar action? Anything similar to this? Not too long ago we read about it Yaakov Avinu and Yosef Yaakov Avinu says to his son I want you to go check out how your brothers are doing Yosef goes but Yosef knew that the brothers decreed that he must die he has a status of a pursuer and he has to die so why in the world did Yosef go to the brothers it's dangerous who gave him permission If you say that, you take away the whole question. But we need to find out, to look at what our forefathers did, did and try to figure out how we can learn from it. If we don't have Ruach HaKodesh, so we can't rely on the stories in the Torah. If it's Ruach HaKodesh and he is a Navi, he is a prophet, no problem. But if we bring it down to regular people, and they conducted themselves based on the halachot of the Torah, we give him permission. That's a beautiful answer. <coughs> But we have to look at it in our eyes that we are not prophets. Can we use that story? The Primagadim asks this question. He has a sefer on the Torah called Tevat Gome. And there he asks this question. He says, Who gave Yosef permission? Who gave Yaakov permission to send his son? And he says, At the time of Yosef HaTzadik, the mitzvah of Kibud Av was very degraded in the eyes of people. Didn't give it, people didn't give it enough respect. And when a person, a great person, Adam Gadol, a great person, a sage, sees that you need to strengthen a certain mitzvah, he can risk his life even without mitzvah. But there's another thing. In Tractate Menachot, page 41, we learn that even though a person can go throughout his life without putting on tzitzit, if he doesn't have four corners on his garment, he doesn't need tzitzit. It's called nullifying a positive commandment. It's not transgressing something, it's just not doing a mitzvah. Yet, Hashem punishes in a time of wrath of Hashem 
Hashem punishes a person for not wanting to do this mitzvah. Heading so halacha d'mzuya gemara masred menachona a daf tzon bilachana. Forty one. Okay. If ti asun if ti kisunam ti alem miichat tzon talit aki talit aki aalebo achawaki chima eitzon talit aki aalo ahile achawaki chima elo eitzon achawaki tzaom eitzon achawaki elo eitzon. No, apun pa inbo. We learn from that Gemara okay. that when there is time of wrath of Hashem, mm-hmm. anger of Hashem, Hashem punishes even for nullifying a positive mitzvah. Okay. Is there a greater time of a wrath than the Holocaust? Holocaust and two weeks ago, it's the same. Two months ago, it's the same thing. Is there a greater time of wrath of Hashem? Based on that, could be, maybe, maybe that the mother would be allowed to send her kid with that feeling. And in tracted Manahot, we also learn the one who puts on that filin will have longevity. So maybe it cancels one out. On one hand, it's very dangerous, on the other hand, you get longevity from this mitzvah. Maybe they cancel each other out. Maybe. So, Alan Khan, Allah take it down to the other film mitzvah, and the other one is the other one. 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 The other one is he wasn't able. First of all, it was in Simchat Torah, Firina Mukti. It was on Shabbat when he ran to the other place. He was he got stuck there and he couldn't come back to his house, and it was dangerous. So he didn't do anything wrong. Now he got stuck the following day, which you have to put on Firin without the Firin. But on Shabbat he wasn't able to do it. What's that? We're not asking. We're asking, are you allowed to go and risk your life to give him that fitting? Okay. He doesn't have to risk his life. The question is, is he allowed to? Okay. The same question will be on the father. If he calls us and says, can I cross the street and go? The same question will be, can I risk my life in order to do this? The kid is also getting the mitzvah of kibudav. On the way, he's adding another mitzvah. Okay. <coughs> That's a wonderful point. Wonderful point. <laughs> wonderful point. <laughs> I want to share with you another case, very interesting, that happened on the first day of the war. Down south, in one of the hospitals, the first siren. <coughs> One of the nurses in the hospital, as soon as she heard the siren, she ran away. She was trained that you stay with the old person that you take care of, that you can't leave. Or if you're treating a, a, a patient that can be wheeled, you take him with you to the safe place. But you don't run away by yourself. But she <laughs> was so afraid, she was in shock, she ran away by herself. Now the management comes and asks, should we fire her? 
What do you say? Would you like to have a nurse like that on the staff? What do you say? I feel scared, but like, I think that... She you know how many times they train them? You don't leave the patients. So many times they did these drills. Again and again and again and again. But when the first siren came, oh, she was so afraid, she ran away. Scary. The first time she was a siren. Very, very scary. She said, I lost control. What's that? So you want to fire her? Let's get rid of her. No rachamim on Hanukkah? She knows how to be a nurse. She studied many years and she's a good nurse. But she got afraid? What's that? Not when you're hired to do a certain job. Imagine you are the bodyguard of the Prime Minister, of the President. And when somebody comes to shoot, you say, bye bye, and you run away. My life comes first, not when you're hired to do a job. A captain of a ship of a ship is supposed to be the last one if the ship drowns. Can it be? Water comes in, the ship slowly goes down, and the captain says, You're on your own, I'll see you later. And he has five hundred people there and he goes fast first. Can it be? As a captain, his job description is to stay until the end. He has to be the last one. If you don't want that job, don't take it. Do something else. We'll say to the nurse, if you don't want this job, go do something else. But the job description says, and we trained her many times, you have to stay with patients. <laughs> Say something? No, it's actually a story about the captain. He left. In Italy, about 10 years ago, the Italian no, it ship. I think about 10 years ago, there was an Italian ship that was drowning. I don't remember how many um, people were on it, passengers, maybe 150, and the captain was the first one to jump out. He was sued. You're not allowed to do that. Mm-hmm. But what about our nurse? So we're firing her? We're getting rid of her? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody agrees? <laughs> he wants to keep her. But, but this is a job description. Would you like a person that treating you or your loved one? We did. We trained her so many times, but when was the real thing came, she got scared. You fire her. Everybody's firing her. Fire her, get rid of her. Let's look what the Torah says. Parashat Shmot. Perek Dalet, Pasukima. Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, you're holding a staff, you're holding a stick, throw it down. He does. What happens when he throws it down? It turns into a snake. It turns into a snake. What does the Torah say right after it turned into a snake? What happened? Vayanos Moshe Mipanav. Moshe Rabbeinu ran away. Excuse me? You're talking to Hashem? What are you afraid? 
This is the first siren. You're afraid? You're talking to Hashem? Who asked this question? And it says, and his language is, this is a wonder about our master Moshe. Where are you running to? And what are you running from? Think about it. He's talking to Hashem and he's running over there. Hashem is not there. Is Hashem not there? And if Hashem wants to protect you, He can protect you here from 50 snakes. And if He doesn't want to protect you, you're not going to be protected when you run there. What are you doing? Says the <laughs> That's the answer of the Amigdava. Wow. Amigdava yeah. says, What are you so surprised? Moshe Abenu is a man of God, but he's a man, he's a human being. And when a human being sees a snake suddenly, it's very, very scary. So he ran away. You see, it's natural. Even to Moshe Abenu. So what do you want from the nurse? You get two points. <laughs> I have another proof from Gemara, Masechet Shabbat. Page 49a. The Gemara tells a story. There was a person by the name of Elisha Baal Knafaim. Elisha, who has wings. What kind of funny name is that? The Gemara tells a story. In the time of the Romans, the Romans decreed that one is not allowed to put tefillin on. And one who puts tefillin, they will puncture his head. They will kill him. Elisha said, I don't care. I'm not afraid of the Romans. And he went to the middle of town and he took out his tefillin and he put his tefillin on. He started putting that fill in and started to pray in the middle of town. Suddenly, he saw a Roman soldier. And the Roman soldier is coming close to him, so he starts running. And he runs and he runs and he runs and he runs, and the soldier is running faster. And he gets really close to him, so Elisha takes off the tefillin and he puts it under his jacket. And he continues to run, and the soldier catches him. Mm-hmm. As soon as the soldier caught him, he said, What do you have there? What do you have there in the jacket? He says, No, that's uh, just wings. Wings of a dove. And the soldier says, I don't believe you. Take it out. So he takes it out, and Hashem made a miracle, and the tefillin turned into wings of a dove. And that's why he's called Elisha Baal Knafaim. That's why he's called Elisha with the, the one with the wings, because Hashem made for him this unbelievable miracle with the wings. Yeah, <coughs> Yashiv asks on this story, Elisha, what happened to you? Ten minutes ago you said, I don't care about the Romans, I'm not afraid. You see the soldier, you start running. When he gets closer, you take that feeling off, you put him in the middle of town. You didn't care. What happened? 
in zota atu mi masanga bazala lung ta ngam san ta na vai na vai hilo is da na tu atu na sia tu ma e ke ma ta hai poe sa bing mai mai poe te itile kitak ki tu atu ma te you see when a person sees a roman soldier he scared he forgets about everything that he said oh i don't care about them but you see a roman soldier running after you you're afraid you're scared when you hear the first siren you're afraid I think based on these two sources we have to show a little more mercy than you guys wanted to show the nurse and we can keep her but only if it happens once she comes and she says I apologize I know we trained. I'm supposed to stay. It's not going to happen again. It's the first time, and I was afraid. If it happens again, get rid of her, because the other people on the staff stayed, so it's possible to stay. But she says it only happened once. I think we can keep her. If it can happen to Moshe Rabbeinu, okay. if it can happen to Elisha Baklafaim, it can also happen to a nurse down south. <laughs> You did very good before and you got two points. Now I'm going to ask you another question. If you don't know it, I'm going to take back those two points. So be careful. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> While the whole thing was going on, Torah, there was a family, a father and three kids. A boy, a boy, and a girl. Mm-hmm. The mother wasn't there. And he saw the Hamas coming close to his house. Mm-hmm. And everybody knew everything. Everybody was texting each other and WhatsApp. They knew exactly what was going on. Mm-hmm. So he has to run away from his house. Because if he stays, they're going to kill them all. He shot on himself. There's a father with three kids, two boys and a girl. And he sees from the window, the terrorist coming close to his house. So he has to run away. Okay. Alright, <laughs> If he realized that if he leaves from the main entrance, the Hamas are going to kill him. So he can only leave through the back door. The problem is, he can only take one kid with him. Mm -hmm. And the question is, which of the kids should he take? There's Ruven and Shimon, and there's Rachel. Two boys and a girl. And by the way, he likes one of the boys a little more than the other. If you think it's a consideration, maybe not. Two boys and a girl, he can only take one with him. Whom should he choose? What do you say? It's a tough question. Be careful, there's two points. Why? And why can't he have more children or more offsprings through his daughter? Uh, 
The name of the family will change, but it is his grandchildren. More than that, more than that, if his son is around and he gets married to someone, those babies will be in an oven of a lady who is not from his family. She is going to be the one taking care of them for nine months. If it's his daughter, it's really an extension of him. <coughs> Maybe that's more important. He's suggesting yeah. that we should keep one of the kids yeah. because one of the kids one day will get married yeah. and he will have children. So it's like an extension of the father. Mm-hmm. Maybe not. Where are these kids going to grow up? In an oven, in a womb of a lady who's not from the family. Because his kid is going to get married to someone outside of the family. Okay. But uh-huh. if his daughter, his daughter is really an extension of him and she will have, she will get married one day and it's going to be in her womb which is an extension of the father. Okay. Tribes. That's just the name. You're going to have a family name. So what? And if you want to save one of the boys. Which boy do you want to save? The one who he likes better or the other one? Which one do you save? Oh, oh. We need an answer fast. They're coming close. He needs an answer. <laughs> they both fulfill Kibudav, but he likes one of them better. Is that even a consideration? Uh, the firstborn. Why? Why? We know that the firstborn gets double portion in the inter- inheritance, but why does he get first priority to be saved? All the same. Three kids, wonderful children. One is a girl, two boys, and he likes one of the boys better. But everything else is equal. Anyone wants to save the girl? Well, we don't <laughs> care about the girl. <laughs> the girl. The girl. Why? <laughs> and therefore, why does that give her prioritization? <laughs> and therefore, that gives her prioritization to be saved first. I don't know. Can first or second or not? Go his own way. No, whether it's this no may he let us telling it. Castle dot thing, Kate up and a new bed to go on them. Merit him, 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 yes. You can only take out with you and escape with one. Maybe the girl, because she's more fragile and she won't be able to fight back as easily. Nobody will be able to to, to, to fight. (laughs) Many terrorists with guns and their little kids. Nobody's going to... Whoever stays, we know what the end will be. Let's make a difference. Let's say 14 and 15, the boys, and the girl is 13. Or 7 and 8 and 5. 
They're not surviving. We know that. Unfortunately, they're coming with guns. The kids don't know, don't have guns. Because there's only room through the back door to go with one person. Okay. And the father is kind of older and he is sick. He can only carry with him one kid. Can't take more. How about the, like, how about the father carries like, one of the young children and like, the, the whole kid? You're trying to give me an advice, but I want a halachic answer. You're trying to get out of the question, but I want to go back into the question. I like what you're saying, but I want to deal with my question. The youngest one. The youngest one. Why? Whoever stays, whoever stays, will know what their end will be. It's clear. But you can only save one. So it's not like the older of the kids will be able to be saved if he stays. Whoever stays, <laughs> that will be his end. If it is to me, I'm going to save my elder son. Why? Because my descendant will be counted to my elder son. Why? The other kid, the second, the middle kid, let's say it's a boy, boy and a girl. The middle kid one day will grow up, will get married, he will have children. It's also your descendants. What's the difference? Why? Where is the source to say that? That's a great chidush, it's a novel thought, but I need a source to say that. <laughs> Lama. And therefore? Do you really think girls are the ones who usually don't yell and scream and they stay more calm than the boys? <laughs> <laughs> really? I think that's also not less a chidush than what your father said. Not less than a chidush. Great chidush. Not so sure. A bechol. Why is a bechol getting to be saved first? Well, see, he's the oldest and he knows so how to take care of himself pretty well and also he has more space. No difference between a 7 year old and a 6 year old. Or 14 and 15. They both know how to take care of themselves or they both don't know. You have to know. It's how to do a seat in the cup and I don't think that it's not. It's not. Yeah. but Yitzchak didn't save Yaakov it wasn't a life and death situation that we see that Yitzchak preferred saving Yaakov over Esav where is the source to that? But instead of going back to Parashat Toldot, skip over to Parashat Vayishlach. We just read it not too long ago. Do you remember Parashat Vayishlach? When was that? <laughs> Last week, a few days ago. Yaakov Avinu is going to fight Esav. He's getting ready. The Pasuk says, he put the sons of the Shvachot okay. and the Shvachot first. Behind them he put Leah and her children. And all the way in the back, who did we put? Rachel. Rachel and her kids. Why? Rashi. Three words. Acharon, Acharon, Chaviv. The one who is dear and beloved goes all the way to the back. He wanted to protect him. Yakova <laughs> 
Rashi is not alone. Together with Rashi is Talgum Yonatan. He says, Yaakov said, Esav will start fighting. Maybe he's going to kill the ones in, in, who are in the first line. And then I'll get up and I'll fight with him. And these guys in the back will be saved. The Ibn Ezra says, Because he loved them more, he put them all the way in the back so they will be maybe able to escape. The Radak says the same thing. You have four Rishonim. These are people from 800, 900, 1000 years ago. This is a mistake that most people do. The Targum Yonatan Ben Uziel that we have in the Torah is not Yonatan Ben Uziel. It's very, very early. Yeah. Very early commentary, but it's not Yonatan ben Uziel. That's what we say, Talgum Yonatan. We don't say Yonatan ben Uziel because it's really people attribute it to Yonatan ben Uziel, but it's not. Yonatan. But it's still very early. Yonatan. <coughs> Probably, probably, we don't know for sure. It's probably not the Tana. But what was Yaakov Avinu thinking? Because you love Rachel and her kids, you put him all the way in the back. What is that? Is that a reason to save somebody because you love him? Arav <coughs> Shteyman Zatzal said an answer which is going to be very <coughs> difficult for you to digest and to accept. Very difficult. But listen to what he said. What's the halacha when you have on the table an apple and a pear? What bracha do you say for the apple? What bracha do you say for the pear? they are both whole, complete pears and an apple. They both have the same blessing. Which one do I say the bracha over? Which one should I choose to start with? The one you favorite. It's called Chaviv. The one I like better. So the same thing. I like my kid better. I keep him all the way back to protect him. Do you believe it? <laughs> no, but you see the such concept in halakha of favorite. <laughs> Favoritism. Okay. When everything else is equal, all, I, all I'm left, if one of them was for well, the seven species, one of them was a gif and one of them a mozi, okay. it's not equal. But if everything is equal, but I like him more, I like the apple more. So I can save him, I can start with him, I can save, I can, that's why Yaakov did it. <laughs> I said this will be very hard to digest and to accept. I said this answer is going to be very hard to digest and to accept. <laughs> but you know, Arav Shteyman said it. Hello, it is. 
Hundreds and hundreds of years before him, somebody already said exactly the same thing, and that is the Ralbag. The Ralbag, many hold that he is the grandson of the Ramban. It's one of the Rishonim. And he says the same thing. And the Ralbag says, if a person has two troubles coming at him, he should choose the lesser of the evil. He says, look at the proof, Yaakov Avinu. He chose to protect Rachel and her kids because he loved them more, so choose the one which is less. Harsh for you, and that's exactly what your Yaakov did. <coughs> so Rabbi Steinman, it's not his own Kiddush. The Ralbag said the same thing. Ralbag, the Naoma comes in his jail, Masa, Amaya say, Ramban, Tupa, he did, to lay on what he did now. As a man, Pierre Sunam Tiale, Rav Steinman, that's what I said, Bonson, I said, Bonson, some of the Senate. Till Hat to Am a Tisayan, not till me home, Uma, Apollo, me home from the Oma, he ale, Apollo, and names of us make it an ayat. So between the two boys, we have to choose the one that he likes more. We see that there is a proof to that. But what about choosing between the boy and the girl? That, there's a Mishnah in Masechet Torayot, Tractor Torayot, page 13, we learn prioritization when saving lives. And the Mishnah says, if you have a Kohen, and a levy who are drowning in the ocean. You have to save the Kohen first. Why? Because he is more holy, he has more mitzvot. We don't have anything against the levy. We like the levy, he's a nice guy. But the Kohen has more mitzvot, he goes first. Kohen <laughs> What happened if you have a Levi drowning and an Israel? They're both drowning and they're so both nice guys and they're equal. Otherwise, we save the Levi before the Israel because he has more mitzvot. That's what it goes with. And what if it's a boy and a girl? Says the Mishnah, you save the boy. We don't have anything against women. But men have more mitzvot. Women are exempt from time-bound positive mitzvot. How many mitzvot, by the way, they're exempt from? Anyone? Any idea? 30 mitzvot. So the man has 613, let's say. She has 583. So just because one has more mitzvot, that's a prioritization. So the boy over the girl... The boy goes. Between the two boys, we see from Yaakov Avinu, potentially we can favor it, the person that he, the kid that he likes more. So even now here, let to a no matter how much salty he can, so no matter how he had my mom, my mother has my grandma. Now the part that he didn't have, my mother also has. Now, on top of him, is that no matter how much he had. So, how much to no matter how much my mother, so much to my atam that he does not so, I'm not so giving him no matter. Unless, we'll say that the story with Yaakov Avinu is not the same. Why? Because Yaakov Avinu was very, very strong. Two weeks ago, Parashat Vayetze, we learned, that when all the shepherds tried to take off the rock, off the well, they weren't able to. And Yaakov Avinu came and he said, <coughs> he did like that, he just did like that, and suddenly the rock, he was very, very strong. So when he was saying, we're going to put these kids first, but then I'm going to fight. I'm going to try to save the rest. Try to save everybody. Our story, the guy is running away, he's not going to fight. So maybe it's not the same. So maybe we should do a lottery between all the kids and decide whom we should save. <laughs> Do you 
Aki do pitin gala sa tinga ti hier. Khana chu aga sangu ni khana pa e ho di mun pa chu azam go do chu. Aki bang po ti ayong la te hidem. You still have koch? You still have strength for more? <laughs> You're amazing. So let's ask another question. Interesting question. It's not too bad. That's the answer. If we can learn from Yaakov, so we go with the kid that he likes best. Boys over girls, and the kid that he likes best. If we can't learn from Yaakov, so we'll have to do a lottery. Yeah. <laughs> You know, there was a story about 220 years ago. One of the students of Rebbe Chaim Bivolozhin, <coughs> his name was Rabbi Shaya Bardaki. Mm-hmm. He came from Vilna to Israel on a boat. When they came not so far away, a few kilometers, the boat was about to drown. So everybody jumped <coughs> off and he was there with his two little children, a boy and a girl. So he said, come on my back, and he started swimming. Rabbi Shaya Bardaki. He was on a boat coming to Israel, but the boat started to sink. So they all jumped out, and he told his boy and girl, "Up on my back, and I'll swim." So he jumped out, and he told his boy and girl, "Up on and he's swimming, and he's swimming, and he's swimming, and he's swimming, and he's just too tired, he can't continue. So at one point he stops, and he says to his daughter, I am so, so sorry, but I can't continue, you have to get off. The halacha dictates, as we said, a boy comes before a girl. If we'll all continue, all three of us, we will all drown and die. You have to stay here, and I'm going to continue with your brother. And he was crying when he said that. When his daughter heard this, she started crying <coughs> and she started yelling. Daddy, daddy, what are you doing? I only have one daddy. I only have one father. You have to save me. Who can save me if not you? Daddy, daddy, you have to save me. So I said, I'm going to help you. 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 Somehow, he got a second wind. He got more quiet suddenly. And he says to her, Okay, jump on my back. And he swam, and he swam, and he swam, and he made it to the shore. He got to the beach, and he passed out. And the two kids are there, and he is there, and they're safe. A few minutes later, he woke up, he was able to open his eyes, and then he looked at his kids, and he told them, You remember, kids, if ever in your life you will be in a situation where you feel there is no more hope, you do what you just did to me and you start yelling, Daddy, Daddy! Talking to Hashem. Who can help me? I only have one father. You must help me. Who can help me? Only you can help me. And when you do that, Hashem will help. And that's a great message for us to take. We don't have to wait till trouble hits. We can always turn to Hashem and say, Daddy, Daddy, you're the only one who can help. And He will. Yeah, 
So let's move on now to Kupat Cholim. If you ever visit Kupat Cholim, you know what Kupat Cholim is like, right? There's a guy, we'll call him Moving. He comes and he waits for the doctor. There's a lot of people around and he's waiting. Suddenly, a guy comes in and he looks very suspicious. There's something sticking out from his shirt. And Ruven thinks this is either a bomb or a gun. So Ruben is very scared. He goes over to this guy and he says, What do you have there? Take your shirt off. Show me what you have there. What do you have there? The guy says, Leave me alone. What do you want from me? Leave me alone. There was another guy there who was also scared. And he comes over and he says, What do you have there? What do you have there? I don't know I don't like the way it looks. I think you have a gun there. What do you have there? A bomb, take it off. I wanna I wanna see. And the guy says, Leave me alone, you two guys. What do you want from me? And he pushes them away. Ruven was very scared. Punched this guy in the nose. The guy falls down and he rips his shirt and he takes out a wallet. Now the guy's lying down bleeding and he says, Look what you did to my shirt. You know how expensive this shirt is? It's a very special shirt. $250. Very expensive. You have to pay. <laughs> Does he have to pay or not? How come? Why doesn't he have to pay? You know what you're saying? You know what you're saying now? That if tomorrow I see you in the middle of the street and I don't like the way you look, I'm afraid of you, so I tell you, take off your pants. You have to listen to me? And two minutes later I see him and I said, take off your shirt. And I don't like this and I don't like this. Who is this guy to tell me what to take off and what not? Who is he? Yeah, but what if I am also scared of you and I suspect that you're carrying something and take your shirt off in the middle of the street. Do you have to listen to me? You always have to answer? Anybody who comes close to you? Do you have a proof for what you're saying? What do you say? You want to pay him or not? He should pay. Even, even if, like, <laughs> There isn't security now. The guy is not here. The security guard is not here. Yeah, yeah. I guess he went to eat his lunch.
Mm-hmm. How does that help us? When the one came out and asked what you have in your, like, you have the idol and, you, like, you stole my idol and all. How does that help us? I also don't know. I don't know. Yeah, he lo 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 And in fact, the Zohar HaKadosh says, you know why she died? A childbirth when Benjamin was born? Because she caused her father to be upset. Why didn't you ask Godol Hador, his name is Yaakov, he happens to be your husband, and you can ask him for his opinion before you do this? The Zohar HaKadosh says, she caused sorrow to her father, she's not going to be able to raise her son. But that's a different question, was she allowed to do it or not? Fine. But we're asking, are you allowed to do this type of thing? And if you did... Do you have to pay? So I'm saying, if there was only one person, I wouldn't have to pay. Oh, I like the way you think. <laughs> Let's see if we can find a proof to what you're saying in the halacha. Shulchan Aruch, Choshen Mishpat, Siman Shin Pei, three hundred eighty in Choshen Mishpat. They're not exactly witnesses. Witnesses is when you give a testimony in. In the court, in the Beit Din. But the Shulchan Aruch Hoshim Mishpat Simen Shin Pei says, If you're going to save someone, you see Reuven chasing after Shimon, and you run and run and run to stop Reuven, and you break some, you jump on somebody's car and you break it, you don't have to pay. Why? Because if we'll tell you, you have to pay, next time, you're going to say, I never saw anything, I don't know what you're talking about. Let somebody else do it, I don't want to pay. People are not going to save people if we're going to say, you have to pay. So Chazal instituted, you don't have to, you're exempt from paying when you're involved in saving others. But is this really the same? Maybe not. The Shulchan Aruch is talking about a person who is going to save someone. You see Reuven running with a gun after Shimon. This guy didn't have anything. He had a wallet. We say that when you're involved in saving somebody and you break something, you don't have to pay. But here he wasn't involved in saving her. This guy was not a threat. He didn't have a gun, he didn't have a bomb. He had his wallet. So why are you tearing his shirt? But maybe it is relevant to us. Because he did save everybody. There was a lot of people there waiting. And he did save them. They were all panicking. They were all afraid. Saving from a panic is also called saving. But more than that. In Shulchan Aruch, Orachayim, Siman Tafri, Shud Chet, 618, in Hilchot Yom HaKippurim, there we learn, if somebody comes to us in Shul, he says, I don't feel well. I don't feel well. Should I drink? We are not doctors. But there's no doctor in Shul. So we look at him and we say, yeah, you don't look good. You should drink. He should drink. Who gave us permission? We're not doctors. When there are no professionals around, we become the professionals. When there are no professionals, not ish, when there's no professionals, Hashem gave us the authority to decide like professionals. The bodyguard, the security guy is not here. He went for lunch. We become the security officials. And you have to listen to us. Yeah, 
We find something similar to that, Shulchan Aruch, Siman Shin Chafchet, Seif Yud, Ilchot Shabbat. We violate Shabbat not only for Pikuach Nefesh, but mm-hmm. also for Safek Pikuach Nefesh. Mm-hmm. But if there are no professionals around, we become the professionals and we violate Shabbat. Same thing here. When there is no one around, the professionals are not here, the security, the guard is not here, we become the professionals. So don't tell me that I tore his shirt. You know who tore his shirt? Mm-hmm. He did! Why didn't you listen to us? Mm-hmm. We asked you to cooperate. Show me what you have there. Open the shirt, take out your wallet and show me everything's okay. You didn't cooperate, so I didn't tear your shirt. I don't have to tear it, to pay you if I didn't tear it. You know who tore your shirt? Mm-hmm. You tore your own shirt. Yeah, it's not but now I have a new question on this. Okay. When the guy who tore the shirt will be older, when he puts on clothes, will they warm him up? <laughs> the guy who was afraid and he tore the shirt of this guy. Mm-hmm. When he becomes older, mm-hmm. 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, sometimes people who are old, they're cold. The guy who ripped the shirt, mm-hmm. sometimes they're old, they're cold. <laughs> when he puts clothing on himself, <laughs> will the clothes help him to warm him up? <laughs> Why am I asking? Because in the Haftarah we read Parashat Chayei Sarah we learn about David HaMelech and the Pasuk says when David HaMelech was old they covered him with layers and layers of clothing and they didn't warm him up. The Gemara in Brachot Samech Bet explains why. ואני that when David HaMelech was hiding from Shaul who pursued him and wanted to kill him, he was hiding in a cave. At one point Shaul came to the cave, but it was very dark. David HaMelech took a knife and he tore off a little piece of Shaul HaMelech's jacket. And then Shaul went and he crossed the river and David HaMelech came out and said, Look, look, look! I could have killed you and I didn't! Look, I have a piece of your jacket in my hand. I could have used the knife to kill you and I didn't. So stop pursuing me. And it worked. Because he ripped his jacket, he disgraced the clothing. Later on in his life, the clothing don't help him. Why? One who disgraces clothes, the clothes don't help him. So, please say, I'm telling you, David Lampato Sima, be moved, I'm telling you, Shaul in Tadding Adel Lele, and so on. David Lampai, eh, so on, go hot, so I can say, I can say, I can say, I'm only Timaito. Shaul Lampai in David holding a home loot. Mm-hmm. 
asama se jo ven saul na song khol pon ka tha hi nom lang ka tha the ne hitai ai wanga itabang mi ka hi ding na het ka hi na het nom ka ne het ding ka de je na ka tha lo na hi na ya chun ke hi mi kita ka hi thil se bol nom ka hi poi ti hen ya as apo ngi na hi le saul yo apet pe ni na to se ati ati in apom pai ta hi so the Gemara teaches, if you disgrace the clothing, you're not going to benefit from them. That's why I'm asking, will this guy benefit from them? But what do we want from David Amelech? It was a pikuach nefesh. And it helped. So what did he do wrong? Why does it mean, why, why does the Gemara say that he disgraced the clothing? He did what he needed to do to save himself. <coughs> ama yong ate azo nunga dak athu o hitai ti pi pon pon ko yong le von zalo ta bola chu von ni ama anu thu tho tho ding hi ate ate elo de na dak minai khat theta dak dak athu hu ngai ding von lo min ma alo the ta ro ding hi ate chu ti atun ko san dong le ha hi cha ku na chu ko san hung ping do hi e as da vin nang pa pe bo yong ama le ama ki hu do go ai chu na ama le ama ki hu do go a hi cha ama le ma ki hu do na ding a chu hiti wana ga ke chu itida na hiti chun ama chunga le hum le hum le hum kina von zalo chu ataina le von nun thu de tia ko sha nun thu thu nun thai so the uni akov explains you know what he did wrong he cut 15 centimeters why didn't you cut only 10 why did you cut extra 5 centimeters the ben ishai says you know what he did wrong why did you have to cut it right at the corner and nullify it from being obligated in the mitzvah of tzitzit. Yeah. Take a little the other part. Why specifically there? So that's why he was charged. But that's only David Amelech. Because he is so such a tzaddik, Hashem judges him fav- differently. <laughs> but this guy, in our case, he tried to save a life. I think when he gets older, all the clothes will still work for him and he's not going to be harmed at all. Okay. เนี่ยตาเนี่ยน่าเทเลนตาแล้วก็อาจจะน่าจะบ่อยอ่ะเหี้ยเบนิชไฟมีที่เหี้ยจะนําเตะแล้วน่าเปียจุดาวิดเอ
ไอ้เลยอะไรมาซึนเต็มนี่ขอตรงไปสิไปหัวละอ่ะไอ้เลยอะไรเปล่าเมื่อสกิตซูซูเรียนวันนั้นพี่ฮัมเซียเดียวเ
said this is not relevant in our times. In our times, in normal places, a non-Jew doesn't take a knife and stabs the Jew just because he is different than him. It doesn't happen by us. Therefore, this reason doesn't apply anymore. And remember, this soldier is fighting for us. He is risking his life for us. And therefore, it should be no problem to give the tzitzit to this soldier. I say the Prime Minister. As we start to learn, Amar Masan, Kum Zachat Masan, Na Um Chayi Adam, Eni Pi Nesu Nam Tale, Tuchana Tuchana Itzi Om Tzitzit Apu Etz Ipola Om Tzitzit Alona. As it so, Tuchana Ata Banga Zentel Chatzun Nang Jews Nima Na Mo Atayim Pola Nga Nale. Ita Bang Tzitzo Aki Mo Beis Etapu Ni Azu Asi Na Om Tzitzit Apu. Adi Atu Din Munahi Eho Even Din Wa Zentel Chat Nung Ki Beda Ohi Zin Azu Nale. Se Pai Pa Azu. So Pai Din Tzu Abu Ina Nza Om Tzitzit. But what about the Tfilin? No. Can we give a tefillin to a person who is not so Jewish? You don't like it. For the same reason. You like it? No. No tefillin. Anyone wants to disagree? Oh, we are unanimous on this one. No tefillin. Hmm? You probably didn't see the Rambam. Last night when you look in the Shuchan Aruch. My view is... Uh, will the real powers of Tiflin and Tzitzitiba uh, really to the going? I don't know if it's going to help him or not, but can I give it to him? The Rambam in Chot Melachim, chapter Yud, Halacha Yud says, if a guy wants to do a mitzvah, any mitzvah, we don't stop him. He wants to do the sukkah, let him say the sukkah. He wants to shake the lulav, let him shake the lulav. Hanukkah candles, he wants to do Shiloh HaKet, whatever mitzvah he wants, we don't stop him. According to the Rambam, they can do it, they can do it. A goy wants to sit at home and eat matzah and do a Passover, we don't stop him. Shabbat is unique. But any other mitzvah says the Rambam, if a goy wants to do it, we do not stop him. He can even say a bracha. According to that, do we have a problem giving it? No. But there is a Radbaz. The Radbaz there on the Rambam says, I agree with the Rambam, except three mitzvot. They have too much Kedusha. Not fitting for the non Jews' body. What mitzvot are those? Mezuzah, Sefer Torah, and Tfilin. According to the Ramba, to the Radbaz, we cannot give the Tfilin to this person. Rambamin hilchot melachim avtiyas olam tiyale. Mitzvah epiyon ezen terchatun abol no malle abol tehiyetis na boas alim tehiyetis. Ano epiyon epi mitzvah yonan abol tehiyetis. Asen na um poe him la amun azur advas mitzvah olam tiyale. Til tom vang omin a til tom asan din azur tom vang na pidin asur tehiyetis. Biham tiyale mezuzah tefilin to sefer Torah. Sevang zu ezen terachur ana koid olohi tehiyetis. But what we're saying, based on the Rambam, <coughs> is that the goy can decide to do things for himself, not to be giving to him. But we said before, we have no problem giving it to him. Here, according to the Radbaz, since it has too much kedusha, it's not fitting for him. You can't, you can't give him. However, even though we said that. The Rema in Shulchan Aruch Yoridea Reish Tzadi Aleph Seif Bet says You're not allowed to sell a mezuzah to an Anjou. But if it's going to cause animosity, eva, hatred, and it's dangerous, you're allowed to sell to him. Here, think about it. This soldier is holding a weapon and he's going to fight for you. He's going to save you. He's risking his life. And you don't want to give me this tefillin? Do you remember I have a gun? You still don't want to give it to me? <laughs> Is it a good idea? It can cause big time animosity. And therefore, in this case, even that tefillin we will give him. Okay. The Rema in Shulchan Aruch. Yoredea Reish Tzadi Aleph Seif. Shulchan Aruch. Mezuzah, you're not allowed to 
They translated it to Greek. Yeah, but like they wrote, they didn't write oh, yeah. it in like black ink, but they wrote it in gold. Who said that? I just read it from a church. Yeah, but yeah. so h- how are you comparing it? He just wanted to translate it. He didn't want a sefer Torah that's going to read in shul. He wanted to know what the Torah is about in his language. And even though you weren't allowed to, they had special permission because it was very dangerous. If the king says, do it, and you don't do it, it can be problematic. Similar in that that it can cause hatred and animosity. If these guys would call us ahead of time before they went down to Aza, we would say, maybe take out the parashiyot from the tefillin and give them empty boxes. But since they got stuck there, last minute, and they says, give it to me, we can give it. We can give them the tefillin. <laughs> Imagine that we get to see our grandfather and grandmother, Matitiao, and the family who went and fought the Greeks. You realize the Greeks is the biggest army. It's like the United States and Russia and Ukraine together and you have a family of 13 kids 13 people saying come let's fight them it's ridiculous Imagine we get to see them and ask, Grandfather, Grandmother, what were you thinking? <laughs> there was no chance. Why did you do it? And you know, it wasn't the first time they tried to do this to us. The Egyptians tried to do this when we were by the ocean, by the sea. It doesn't say that the Jews all took weapons and swords and tried to fight. We dive into Hashem. Haman tried to kill us all. Does it say that the Jews got together and formed an army and let's fight? No, we just davened. So, grandfather, why did you decide to take a sword and start fighting? Why didn't you daven? Like in the time of Paro, in the time of Haman. Rebbe Khanan Vasiman, who was a Talmud, a student of the Chafetz Chaim, explained. Paro and Haman wanted to kill us, to kill us, to destroy us, to get rid of us, to get rid of our bodies. The Greeks didn't want to kill us. They wanted to destroy us spiritually, to remove us from the connection that we have from the Torah, the connection that we have to Hashem. When you want to be successful in spirituality, you have to give over your spirituality. You have to be willing to give over your nefesh. You have to be willing to die for it. Greek 
because what is spirituality? It's a glow, it's a light from Hashem that He gives and bestows on us. If you want to get this special light, you have to be willing to give over your neshama, which is spiritual, and Hashem bestows on you spiritual light. <coughs> When I think of you and I see you and I know I have a for how many years? I think of you guys as the Hashmonaim of our times. What you went through the Mesirut Nefesh you displayed. Back in India, not just here in the last two months. What you did for Hashem, <coughs> you were giving over your Neshama, you're saying, Akadosh Baruch Hu, all I want is to connect to you on the highest level possible. And because of that, when I come here, and that's why I'm so happy to come and see you guys, there's a special mm-hmm. light that radiates from your face, there's a special glow. You are saturated with spirituality because when Hashem sees that people want to connect with Him, He bestows special grace and special light on them, which I see when I come and see your faces. I want to bless each and every one of you that you should continue in your beautiful path. You should continue connecting to Hashem on the highest level possible. And Hashem will continue to shower you immense Hashem with abundance in both spirituality and physicality. You should know no more sorrow. You should know no more pain. Your life should be filled with pleasure with tremendous happiness and with great nachat of kedusha.